Welcome, everybody. As a part of Democrats Abroad series, Delivering Democracy from Abroad, welcome to Youth v. Gov Voices. I am Dana Freeling, a Texas voter residing in Finland and chair of Democrats Abroad Environment and Climate Crisis Council. In partnership with the Global Youth Caucus, we are deeply honored and moved to welcome our panel of speakers today, who are each forging a green path for our beloved planet by bringing truth to power and in a real sense, demanding environmental justice. As I like to say, they're making the road by walking it. Joining us today as moderators from Democrats Abroad Environment and Climate Crisis Council and our U Global Youth Council are Miguel Madrigal in Costa Rica, who is the chair of the Global Youth Caucus, Angela Fobbs in Germany from the ECCC, founding and immediate past chair of the Global Black Caucus and chair of the Bisbad in Germany chapter. Dash Nesbitt in Germany and beloved member of our ECCC steering committee and Caroline Barnard, um, a 19 year old climate activist based in Prague and a first year university student in plant biology. The film Youth v. Gov showcases 21 young people tirelessly advocating for our planet and environmental justice for almost eight years in litigation which could really change our future. These brave youths have brought suit against the US government in a case called Juliana versus the United States of America in what we hope will shine in history as does Brown v. the Board of Education. Joining us today are co-lead counsel, Phil Gregory, who has helped empower these youths, one of the accomplished youth plaintiffs, Nathan Baring, and the filmmaker who poignantly tells their story, Christy Cooper. The battle to contain climate change will be won or lost in this decade, and the 2022 election results will realistically determine whether the U.S. can continue in a trajectory to lead the drive to divert the most catastrophic consequences of global warming. The Inflation Reduction Act, the Inf infrastructure bill and ratifying the Kigali Amendment are all a step forward, but the gap must be bridged between this progress and success. The new UN World Meteorological Organization report today, um, it was released just today prior to the COP27 climate conference beginning next week in Egypt, signals dire warnings on the state of global emissions. Despite Biden's ambitious climate achievements, the government faces mounting pressure to expand fossil fuel production to rein in inflation and address energy security concerns amid Russia's insidious war in Ukraine. This all risks shredding COP26's most concrete achievement, a global consensus to cut down on coal. The best arguments or scientific data frequently do not change people's point of view, unfortunately, but a good story can. And within that is the complications of the human condition. A good story is filled with frighteningly terrible things, heroic points of light, and a magnificent, magnificent display of human potentiality. Christie's documentation of these activists achieve just that. It engages audiences through deep and emotional connections in order to bring about change. Youth v. Gov has inspired us and we hope you feel the same. We invite you all to help build a sustainable world in your everyday lives, but also with your vote. Vote like your life and our planet depends on it, because it does. Now we are honored to hear from DA's esteemed international chair and vice chair of the DNC's Youth Council, Candace Kariston. Thank you so much for joining us today, Candace. Um, welcome. 
Great. Well, thank you so much, Dana, um, for those inspiring, uh, alarming, but inspiring welcoming remarks. Uh, I could not agree more, and I'm thrilled to be joining all of you uh, today, wherever you are in the world. On behalf of Democrats Abroad, again, I just want to welcome you today to meet the real champions in the struggle to fight for our global climate emergency. Democrats Abroad uh, has what we call country committees all around the world. We also have a vast array of constituency caucuses and council councils, uh, including our most new council, the Environmental and Climate Crisis Council led by Dana and our Global Youth Caucus spearheaded by Miguel. Uh, so I'd just like to take a moment to thank both of you and your teams for all the work that you have done throughout this election year uh, and in putting together today's event. They've organized this exceptional panel with leading voices associated with the Children's Trust cases and the award-winning documentary, Youth Vigo. And also again, a very warm welcome to all of our moderators and speakers who are with us today. As these young people do their part to heal our planet and hold the government responsible for taking action, we too must do our part in delivering democracy from abroad. To continue the historic legislative progress the Biden-Harris administration has made. And I don't think you know, that really deserves going back to uh, and emphasizing truly how historic things like the Inflation Reduction Act have been. It's the largest investment the United States has ever made in combating climate change. But we have to keep doing our part. We need to make sure that the Biden-Harris administration has a Congress and state legislators in place who are working with them on an agenda uh, towards climate mitigation and action, uh, not just in the next two years, uh, but for the decades to come in the United States. And that starts by growing our majorities on November 8th in the US Senate and in the US House of Representatives. I can't understate the importance of this election. There are now 35 US Senate seats Every single US House of Representatives uh, seat is up for grabs, 46 state legislatures, 36 governorships. In just 12 days, these offices will be voted on and they're the offices where things like climate action, decisions are being made about just that. So I urge all of you to make sure that your ballots are in. Please make sure that your family and friends are voting both at home and abroad. This election is too important to sit out for our climate and so many other issues that can't wait. If you're living overseas, please head to votefromabroad.org right now. Uh, if you need to get your ballot, if you have your ballot, please return it as soon as possible. Uh, if some, it varies by state, your state might require you to mail it back, to courier it back. Uh, please don't delay any longer. If your state does let you return it by email or fax, we strongly encourage you to take advantage of those options. If you need any help, we're here when you don't see Dana on this event or Miguel or Angela or anyone on this event, they are busy helping voters around the world get their ballots back. Uh, we have live voter help happening on Zoom. We have an email address you can write to get your questions answered. And we were also able to secure courier discounts. So if you are in one of those states that requires you to send it back by mail, your country may have a courier discount available. You can get all those links at democratsabroad.org slash votingfromabroad101. So just a few more words, 12 days to go. Uh, please help us do more. I wanna just say a few more words about what we are doing to really find every last voter abroad and make sure that they're voting. We're running phone banking campaigns right now to voters from battleground states and swing congressional districts all around the world. So you can hop on at any time of the day and make calls to very friendly Democrats uh, who have voted from abroad. Just as a reminder, right, please request your ballot. Maybe you've received one of these uh, phone calls yourself in the past few days. Become one of our callers. We have a training happening later today. If you want to jump from event to event, uh, it starts at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. We have another one on Saturday. Uh, get trained up on phone banking, democratsabroad.org slash phone banking underscore training. And the other request I'd like to make to you is if you are able to support our programs for fun, phone banking, texting, digital ads, again, all targeted at battleground and swing congressional district voters abroad, please contribute uh, to these programs that we've been running 
throughout the whole year uh, and especially making those count these last 12 days. So if you're able to contribute to these, please do at democratabroad.org slash donate underscore ECCC. So with that, thank you again for being here. Uh, really looking forward to this and I'll pass it back to you, Dana. So now we are going to um, show you the trailer from Youth Be Gov. For those of you who weren't able to see the film, I think that will give you a taste of what these young people have been uh, facing and what they have been doing. Like youth who have come before us in the civil rights movement and other social justice movements, it is often the young among us that shine the light on systems of injustice. For a lot of young people right now, Life is really scary. Hurricane Matthew hit head on, and it's just so terrifying. If this drought gets any worse, our way of life will dissolve. Just as my family's farm is threatened by climate change, so too are the very stability and vitality of our country. The government is taking actions that are directly contributing to the destruction of our planet. We have evidence going back to the 50s that government and the fossil fuel industry knew that if they continued to burn fossil fuels, that it would cause catastrophic impacts. That's when they started editing climate reports. It's all because of choices that we had no participation in. And I'm scared for my future. It's the greatest dereliction of civic responsibility in the history of the Republic. 21 young people ages 11 to 22 are suing the federal government over policies they say are destroying their world. We are not willing to wait around for someone else's timeline to dictate the trajectory of our lives. I look forward to standing in court with all my fellow plaintiffs. I love you all. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth? I do. Whether we win the lawsuit or not, we are already making ripples in the world to show real change can come from young people standing up for what they believe in. All right. Of all the cases working their way through the federal court system, none is more interesting or potentially more life-changing than Juliana versus the United States. Wow, gives me goosebumps just seeing the trailer again. It was it was such a powerful, such a powerful film and such a such an inspirational representation of um, what can be done, what you heroes really have done. So um, to get the the panel questions started, I I want to ask each of you the same question. Um, and the, but for I will introduce we will introduce each of you separately um, with the with the task in mind that you should answer this question. Um, can you tell us about your individual journeys in getting involved in the Juliana um, versus the United States case? I'm sure it's different from for all of you and at, at different stages in the last eight years. So um, first I'm going to introduce Christy. Uh, Christy is the director and filmmaker, uh, Christy Cooper. She is a PhD scientist. She's actually a neuroscientist. She's also a documentary filmmaker and an Emmy Award winning cinematographer. Her storytelling story and visual narratives focus on issues of justice and impact through human connections to the most pressing issues of our time. Her film awards include Wild Screen's Panda Award for Best Campaign Film, Jackson Wilde's Grand Teton Award, Cleveland International Film Festival's Real Women Direct Award, Woods Whole Film Festival's Best of Festival, Audience Award, and Jury Award for Best Feature Documentary, among others. 
Christy is the inaugural SF Film Vulcan Productions Environmental Film Fellow and the first Jacob Berms Film Center focus on nature, artist in residence. So Christy, um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you got involved in this case? Yeah, thanks Dana. And thanks to all of you with Democrats Abroad who have organized this panel session. We're really excited to be with you today. And um, as I know so many of you are, are um, tuning in from all over around the world, I just wanted to share where I'm tuning in from. I'm zooming in from a valley that was traditionally known as the valley where the rivers mix or the big valley or where there are mountains all around. In the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty, this valley, which is now known as Bozeman, Montana, was designated as the intertribal hunting ground, but it is the traditional homeland of over a dozen nations who continue to recognize it as such. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge where I am actually phoning or zooming in from. Um, yeah, I got involved with this um, film. My history kind of goes back a little bit further than when I started on this film with this case. Um, back in 2010, um, for those of you who have seen the film, you will be introduced to Julia Olson, who is the um, co-lead counsel with Phil on this case. And she started her organization called Arts for Children's Trust back in 2010 with the sole mission of um, um, representing young people around the US who are holding their governments accountable through climate litigations. And in 2011 on, or 2010, I guess on Mother's Day, no, I think it was 2011 on Mother's Day, she filed legal actions in every country uh, or every state in the country, as well as the first federal lawsuit. And I came on board in 2011 through a partnership with Witness, which is Peter Gabriel's social justice and human rights organization based out of New York. And we did a series of 10 short films that were about featuring these state plaintiffs and why they were suing their state governments. And this was my introduction to Shatesca Martinez from Colorado, Kelsey Juliana from Oregon, who was, who was the named plaintiff on this case, um, as well as Jamie Lynn Butler from the Navajo Nation. And, um, you know, I did a deep dive at that time into climate litigation and really trying to learn all that I could. I'm not an attorney, <laughs> um, but I have definitely surrounded myself with attorneys for the last uh, almost 12 years now. And yeah, in 2015, when uh, Julia and Phil uh, filed this newest case, um, this newest federal case, I was, you know, primed and ready to go and watching what was going to happen. And when they had their first win in the district court um, in 2016, that was when I approached Julia and said, I think this is going somewhere. And I would really like to tell this story in a long form. And, you know, would you give me exclusive access to follow this case? And um, I think also through my work that I had done on the, the trust series, um, which is called, it's called Stories of Trust, um, it had, you know, shown to Julia that um, I was able to work with young people and uh, through witness, I really learned a lot about the ethics of um, the, the human rights ethics of filming with young people and with minors. And that was a really important component to me for this film. So, yeah, that's been that's been kind of my tra trajectory with the story. It's been an absolute honor to meet and to become friends and family with young people like Nathan, um, they, who have really changed my life and the trajectory that I've taken. Well, I will uh, introduce the next speaker, Phil Gregory. Uh, Phil is an accomplished trial lawyer, uh, served as co-lead counsel in Juliana v. United States. Since 2010, Phil has served as counsel with Our Children's Trust a pro bono, on a pro bono basis, all while maintaining his litigation practice with the Gregory Law Group in the San Francisco Bay Area. Phil's representative cases litigated issues like title to real property on the California coast and decades-long groundwater contamination, while his pro bono trial work has addressed flooding during Hurricane Katrina, preserving old-growth redwoods in Richardson Grove, and saving coho salmon in the Smith River. In 1976, Phil obtained a BA from Bowdoin College, graduating magna cum laude in two majors. In 1980, Phil obtained his JD and MBA from Santa Clara University. He is a master of the bench and a former past president with honorary William Ingram American Inn of Court. Uh, 
He is also a fellow with the International Academy of Trial Lawyers and a member with the American Board of Trial Advocates. For 18 years in a row, Phil has been recognized as a super lawyer by superlawyer.com. And so, Mr. Gregory, could you please tell us about your journey getting involved with this case? Thanks, Dash. And before I do that, I wanted to uh, emphasize the point Data made about, uh, excuse me, being a voter. I'm a voter. And as Candace said, it's not just important to do the work to vote in Congress, but with the states. And we'll talk about what's happening in the states on climate action later here. But the best example of why voting is important is the youth in Juliana cannot vote when we started this case. And the importance of voting to them should give you all a great reason to go out and vote, to make sure your vote is <clears throat> sent in or whatever you need to do to get it counted. Um, in terms of my experience, I started out doing um, what people call bet your company litigation. I did a lot of uh, um, suing or uh, and defending large companies, uh, prominent individuals and the like. And then in 2010, uh, through a, a mutual colleague, I was introduced to Julia up in Eugene, Oregon, where my then youngest son was attending uh, university. And Julia talked not about I'm going to call it saving one polar bear or shutting down one power plant, but by go, but about going after the entire system, what the fossil fuel energy system in the United States and in countries around the world. And because I did bet your company cases, she was looking for someone. And again, this is back when she hadn't yet started or filed any cases. She was looking for someone to head up what I'm going to call the litigation uh, side to help out when the cases started started to move forward. And so I signed on um, right when she started the organization in 2010. We were involved in bringing cases, as Christy said, on Mother's Day in 2011. And then in 2015, we decided that while we had originally been bringing claims under the public trust doctrine, we would now start bringing a major case under the federal constitution. And we did a lot of work studying both the civil rights movement and other systemic uh, litigation, for example, same-sex marriage in the United States. And we used the lessons from those cases to uh, um, integrate in our complaint in Juliana and brought Juliana uh, in August 2015. And the best part of Juliana, which we'll also talk about later, is the plaintiffs and how they all agreed to sign on board. But Julie and I uh, uh, filed Juliana in August 2015. And as you saw in the movie, we went through a number of, let's just call it adventures, uh, uh, bringing the case to where it is today. And um, with that, Dash, um, I'm going to turn it over to the next uh, uh, moderator. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much, Phil. Uh, first of all, um, this is Miguel from the Global Youth Caucus. If you are a young person between the ages of 18 and 30 to 35, Please, well, uh, please join the Youth Caucus. Go to uh, uh, democratsabroad.com slash YC to join. Um, so as a member of the Youth Caucus, I would like to echo the words said by Phil uh, by saying that I still remember when I was 17 years old and I, I really, truly, desperately wanted to vote and I couldn't because I was still 17. If you can vote, please go to voteforabroad.org to request your absentee ballot today. Now, I would like to in uh, introduce uh, Nathan. Nathan has been a co-plaintiff in Juliana versus the United States since its in inception in 2015, when he began his sophomore year in high school. A third generation resident of Alaska, born and raised in Fairbanks, Nathan has interned in, in state and national government for Representative da David Gutenberg, which is uh, House District 4 
in in the uh, in the Alaska State Legislature and U.S. Senator Alyssa Murkowski. Most recently, Nathan worked on a team of, of six to run the Arctic Encounter Symposium, the United States' largest annual Arctic policy and business conference in Anchorage. He has also worked with Launch uh, Alaska, Alaska's first climate technology business accelerator, helping diversify the state the, the state economy by scaling up startups for deployment success. Nathan graduated from Gustavus Adolphus College in Minnesota with a degree in politics in 2021 and is currently pursuing a master's degree in Arctic and Northern Studies at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where he is concentrating on tribal law and policy. He will eventually attend law school to concentrate on federal uh, Indian law. So Nathan, uh, please tell us about your journey to getting involved in the Juliana versus the United States case. Hey everyone, thank you so much, Miguel. Um, so I know that I, I look a little bit like a old geezer uh, right now, but um, and I am actually now the age of 23. But as um, as Miguel pointed out, this case was filed in August of 2015, so I was actually 15 years old, which would have meant that I was a sophomore in high school. So. I, uh, I'm guessing that will be testament for the audience to uh, what a slog it has been and how long it has taken us to get to where we are. And it may be, uh, or, and you know, and it goes on. And so um, as I sit here as a graduate student now, uh, almost eight years later, I, uh, I am still part of it and still looking toward the future and uh, still certainly uh, enjoy deeply helping Christy, Phil, and uh, being there for all the trials and seeing my co-plaintiffs, which I had the re recent pleasure of doing for the first time since the COVID era uh, this summer in Oregon. So we, we, we reconnected, regrounded, and sort of got our strategy wreck under our feet um, in the post-COVID era to kind of reground for the future. Um, yeah, so my story is, um, is, pr is pretty long, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll shorten it for the purposes of the introduction. But uh, at about age 12, um, I was working in Fairbanks, Alaska, um, and I went to a lecture from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, which is the United States' foremost Arctic research university, and certainly one of the most for, uh, one of the foremost Arctic research universities in the world. Um, and they do a lot of work in the climate science sphere, like permafrost and um, you know cold climate building sciences, etc. And I went to uh, talk from a scientist who was very well known there. Um, I believe it was a uh, Dr. Vladimir Romanovsky, who's one of the world's leading permafrost researchers. Um, and he basically connected with me um, in a short little presentation. What I knew already from living in Alaska was happening on the ground, um, which were the rapidly accelerating effects of climate change and their implications for the future of our state. Um, but he really put the sort of scientific language to it that I had not yet had. Um, and it really lit a fire under me at that point. Um, in a, I, I started writing letters to the editor voraciously and remember I'm 12, right? <laughs> 12, 13 years old. So I'm not exactly taken very seriously. I definitely got a lot of responses uh, that were essentially like, oh, you're really cute parodying the, you know, the opinions of your parents, right? Because that's what most people assume about people that age. Um, and I, I, I got involved at a statewide level in a, in a group called the Alaska Youth for Environmental Action through the Alaska Center, which is based in Anchorage. So we would go down to Juneau, the state's capital, and we would lobby on various um, climate related policy, especially around fishing, for example, as a, as a really important uh, industry for Alaska. Um, and, you know, I, I got involved in uh, local organizing. I, I, I helped plan some marches and we, we showed up outside at the time, I believe I wanted to say, Oh, it was some, it was a secretary of state and I'm forgetting which one who came to Fairbanks for an Arctic conference. And we, we made a, we made a showing outside. Um, and then through my work at the Alaska Center uh, with Alaska Youth for Environmental Action, Julia Olson, the lead counsel in Juliana versus the United States reached out to the Alaska Center and was essentially looking for um, a young person who was interested in bringing the federal action. At that point, there had been, um, you know, a case brought in all of the 50 states and, um, including Alaska. And I, I had not been able to follow, follow the early case from Alaska because I had been too young, but um, I essentially jumped at the opportunity um, that she presented. Uh, and I guess in August 
I want to say August 13th, 2015, when I was just, just, and I might not have even quite have begun it, but that would have been the beginning of my sophomore year in high school. We filed the case and I flew down to Eugene, Oregon for um, its first trial uh, in front of Judge Coffin. Um, and since then, yeah, we've been, we've been all over the country. Uh, we've been, I've, I had no idea really at the time. I, I, I had certainly an, a strong sense of the integrity and trajectory and importance of the case, but I had no idea kind of how um, instrumental in my personal life and in in sort of, um, I guess, the movement it, it ultimately became, especially since I think it was timed so beautifully with the rise of, for example, Greta Thunberg's Fridays for Future movement a few years later and sort of a global reckoning and consciousness uh, that we were lucky enough to you know, the movement's been going on forever, but um, it really feels like we were standing on the precipice of a, a global consciousness and reawakening when we filed the case. And it was only a couple of years later that suddenly there was this upswell that continues. Um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. But thank you for having me. All right. I just want to take a moment and mention our global, our Earth Day and Beyond toolkit. Um, it's a toolkit that we put together to help people try to help in small ways while we persuade our governments to act in large ways. Um, if we're gonna change our trajectory, we're gonna need to change at every level from the top to the bottom. So please take a look at our toolkit. And with that, I have a question for Phil. Um, considering the significant, but albeit imperfect uh, movement of the Biden administration with the new legislation on the Inflation Risk Reduction Act, what would the case's declaratory relief constitute today? Sure, so uh, I wanna give everybody context of um, what is, uh, has been going on in Juliana since the movie uh, uh, came out. So we filed a, um, a motion to amend our complaint which uh, we filed last spring and argued before Judge Aiken in June of 2021. And if you remember from the movie, what the Ninth Circuit, two of the three judges in the Ninth Circuit panel said is, well, the judiciary cannot order the remedy that the plaintiffs seek, the, the, a judge, cannot issue essentially an, what's called an injunction to address the entire US fossil fuel energy system. And that's how that two of the three judges in the Ninth Circuit panel misread or understood our complaint. Now, an interesting thing about um, a federal uh, procedure is that when you're dismissed for purposes of standing, and I'm, I'm giving you a little legal lecture, you'll all become lawyers after you hear this little bit. Uh, after, when, because we were dismissed on standing, our case was still alive. And so what we did is we amended, we sought to amend our complaint to say to Judge Aiken, you can proceed to trial on declaratory relief declaring what the federal government is doing is unconstitutional under the Fifth Amendment, et cetera. So we uh, um, said that the uh, declaratory relief is something the judge can order. And that is important right now because as we all saw under the Inflation Reduction Act, Congress and the Biden-Harris administration were not able to get legislation through anywhere near to what needs to occur at the federal level to address the climate crisis. So what we're trying to do in Juliana is represent these youth to get the court to say that what the federal government is doing is unconstitutional. Remember, Federal government cannot engage in unconstitutional conduct. So if there is a, a decision that the 
fossil fuel energy system at the national or federal level is unconstitutional based on the scientific evidence, which we will introduce at trial, then going forward, the federal government needs to adjust its conduct to address the unconstitutionality. To give you a quick uh, 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 analogy, this is exactly what happened during the civil rights movement in Brown versus Board of Education. In 1954, the United States Supreme Court declared that the prior policy of separate but equal that had been set forth in such decisions as Plessy versus Ferguson was unconstitutional. You could no longer have separate but equal. And then later, the Supreme Court and other courts set about unwinding, as we all know, both in the school system and in other systems, the separate but equal or segregation uh, uh, aspects of society in the United States. Well, that's exactly the process that will be able to occur should Juliana go to trial and should the Judge Aiken declare the National Fossil Fuel Energy System unconstitutional. So the importance of Juliana became heightened primarily because we all know now Congress at as of uh, earlier this year was unable to do what it needed to do. And so Juliana and the constitution are now more necessary than ever. Thank you. Um, I think we have our next question. Uh, actually, Dana, would you like to talk I about that? I needed to unmute. Uh, it's complicated, Phil. These are complicated issues, and it's it's really good to have um, you update us on what has happened since, and I hope we can get into that a little bit more. And I want to remind our other panelists, if there's some question that you would like to contribute to, that you have some other perspective on, please, please feel free uh, to jump in and, and share that. Um, perspective with us. But I will um, jump in now. Um, I first want to take this opportunity to remind everybody though that though we have made great, enormous progress in the last few months with legislation um, in the Biden-Harris administration with the IRA as I spoke about and infrastructure and amending the Kigali Amendment, we are not yet there. We need to bridge that gap. And what we are doing is not quite enough. And we feel at Democrats Abroad that the country needs to declare a national climate emergency. And that is up to our president. We have a petition um, which is being signed uh, globally. And we'd like to share that in the chat. If you haven't already signed our, uh, our petition for the uh, government to declare a national climate emergency. Please uh, take that opportunity now. Angela is going to drop that in the chat. But my next question um, is directed towards Christy, our artist, activist. Um, and I would like to ask you, um, as you have morphed from scientist, which is quite extraordinary, to artist, activist, storyteller, harnessing powerful insight and reaching beyond borders to engage audiences through deep emotional connections to this life, world-changing story of climate change. Um, it is truly inspiring. What further acts of resistance uh, giving us hope and inspiration do you have up your sleeve? Are you staying with this story? Do you have other related um, film projects uh, in the works? Can you tell us um, what you have uh, planned? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, for, for those of, of you who understand a little bit more about how the film world works, um, there's, you know, always always stories that we're, that we're helping to work on and that we're inspired by. I consider myself an artivist, um, an, an activist artist. <laughs> 
Um, and, and really, you know, I, my, ba- my focus on the most, most of the work that I choose to do is on justice issues, social justice and environmental issues um, across the board. Um, I actually moved from being a scientist to a storyteller um, because of my desire to pr- to provide more insight into the scientific world. And this really goes back to, um, for those of you who are old enough to remember the Bush and Bush versus Kerry election. Um, and the, the, the hot topic button or the hot button uh, topic at that time was stem cells. And that was my field of research in neuroscience was working with stem cells. And I was really, I was living in Germany at the time and I was really disturbed um, to see how our political conversations in the US were focusing um, on a very misrepresented and misunderstood um, viewpoints around stem cell research and what stem cells, stem cells are. And this really, I think, added uh, fuel to the fire in the um, anti-abortion movement. And as a scientist working in the stem cell field, it really became apparent to me that part of my job as a scientist at the time was to tell this to tell the story or to tell a story about the work that we were doing and the research and how it applied to the everyday person and really to educate the everyday person on some of these basic scientific principles. So that kind of started my journey into the whole storytelling movement. I, I joined a, um, a few years later when I was then living in Sweden and working there, I joined an interdisciplinary group of researchers from across Europe who were very engaged in public awareness and understanding of science. And we created traveling um, science fairs that traveled around Europe. And um, and then this eventually led to me wanting to move back to the United States and get my MFA in science and natural history filmmaking. Um, so I've, you know, I've, I've really been, been focused on these issues. My first, um, I think, like climate story that I focused on was right after the Deepwater Horizon disaster um, off the Gulf of Mes- Mexico. And I packed all my film gear into my car and drove from Montana down to Louisiana and wanted to connect with the scientists on the ground there to help tell the story of what was happening. And in so doing, um, we were actually chaperoned around the bay before the oil came in by um, some captains um, who were shrimpers and fishermen whose who's, uh, the shrimping had been closed down. So they were looking for jobs. And these captains um, happened to be, uh, um, and an indigenous tribe that lived outside of the levee system, outside of New Orleans, outside of Southwest Louisiana. And they have lived there for over a thousand years and have been extremely impacted by the petroleum industry over the last seven decades. And they actually invited my colleague and my friend and I to live with them for three weeks and to see what they were experiencing. And they took us around through the marshes and showed us the more than 10,000 miles of pipelines that go through the marshlands there that have really destroyed um, their way of life and their their ability to live subsistently. Um, So this was really my introduction to some of these social injustices, environmental justice, environmental racism, that really people on the front lines in communities face. And I continue to be drawn to those stories. to be able to elevate those voices, to provide platforms for those voices. Those are often the voices that are least represented, represented, have the least amount of resources to have their voices heard and to be able to make a difference or, or at least to have their voices heard in the way that our democracy currently functions. Um, so I will continue to, to, to do that type of work and um, I'm always interested in, in collaborating with people on these stories. Thank you so much, Christy. Well, we're going to hear from Caroline uh, now, um, our climate activist in Prague, uh, who's studying, I believe, plant biology there. And um, she's going to address Nathan. Thanks, Caroline. Yes, Nathan. So I have a question for you. Um, Just as there are tipping points in passing benchmarks in climate change, there are also tipping points in propelling great social movements forward. 
How do you, a young man from remote Alaska, see your role in heralding in hope for our future? Thank you, um, Caroline, for that question. I think definitely I really resonated a lot with um, how Greta put it when she said um, that she was paralyzed essentially for years when she was doing nothing. Um, and then when she found herself finding like-minded young people and getting deeply engaged in movement building and kind of finding her role, that is when she felt the most empowered, just no matter what you know, the predictions became. Um, I think one of the, I think one of the biggest, I want to say most, one of the biggest misconceptions and one of the biggest opportunities in our young generation is, um, you know, our, we, 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 we often believe as often young people do that we are novel um, and that what is happening, that, that the kind of the, that the uncertainty and the danger and the, the immense damage that we're going through is not something that previous generations have had to fight in some capacity. I agree that, you know, the climate crisis is a really unprecedented threat to our generation, but every generation has sort of gone through their own struggles. And it's also, we constantly readjust our framework to the benefits basically that our parents and grandparents built for us, right? We now assume things like, um, the benefits that were won by, you know, second and first wave feminism, for example, or movements for civil rights, we assume them because we were, they are now our birthright. And it means that we have to fight for them, but we get the privilege of standing on those shoulders. And it's the same thing for the climate crisis. I think one of the, one of the things that gives me the most hope is recognizing how much groundwork has been laid in the climate movement for young people to step up in our, in this moment in our moment and and really choose, make the conscious choice to be part of making this our chance to make our own contribution to the trajectory of the world and our lives. And I think that's a very empowering way to look at how civil rights, frankly, have always worked, right? Like you never, you never do it as a as one person or one lawsuit or one movement. You always stand on sort of as you know Martin Luther King famously said that moral arc that you build on many many people that came before you. Um, so it's it's both a matter of it's a, it's a matter of recognizing where you come from and how much work has been laid for you to even be in the position of being able to join a movement, and it's also about kind of you know decentering your own fear, guilt, what have you, which is which can be challenging and and really thinking more broadly about the beautiful world that you're building with other like-minded folks in a movement, right? Um, and, and, and really leaning into to that. Um, and I, I, I don't know if that is hopeful for everyone, but I find that to be a very hopeful thing when, 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 when the only, what, it, what is certain is that challenges lie ahead. But the only thing that is uncertain is whether young people choose to engage in fighting it or whether they choose to take a step back basically and, and just wait for what they falsely assume is the inevitable. I, I just wanna build on what Nathan said. Um, I've been practicing law for uh, over 40 years and the plaintiffs in Juliana are the best group of plaintiffs I've ever had the honor of representing in my life. I don't know what you all were doing when you were like Nathan, a sophomore in high school, I wasn't deciding whether or not to sue the federal government. I wasn't uh, attending court hearings in my case or being deposed by attorneys for the Department of Justice or as other plaintiffs testifying before Congress. Um, what these youth do is remarkable and they give me hope that for, I'll call it my geezer generation, there is a way out of the climate morass. We just need to trust the voices of these young people. And I'm also involved in state cases where uh, attorneys for our children's trust and local attorneys have brought cases in states throughout the United States. For example, in June, uh, 2023, we have a trial uh, um, going against the state of Montana and the trial will be on starting on June 12 in Helena, Montana. But the youth in the held case have been defending their depositions and they have the same hope. They believe 
that our courts can do the job when our legislative and executive branches of government are not doing it. The youth believe that the science will come into evidence and that the science will help uh, uh, the judge craft the right order to get in Montana the state back on track or the youth in Juliana believe that Judge Aiken will craft the right order to declare what the federal government is actively doing is unconstitutional. And it's that hope that they have in at least one of our branches of government that gives me great pride in representing them. I also wanted to add just um, my sense of my, my experience of working with these young people and being involved in this climate space with young people for over a decade now is that, you know, as, as we've already mentioned um, in this panel, so many of these young people cannot vote. They are too young to be able to vote. And that really brings in the importance of the rest of us who are a voting age and, and can make a difference with, with our ballots. But, but also, um, I think it it's really behooves us to consider how much weight and responsibility is put on the shoulders of these young people. Um, you know, the older generations, we often look at the younger generations as our hope and our guiding force, which they are, and they should be, and they sh their, their platform should be upheld and supported. But the weight is not theirs alone to bear. And I think it's really important for us to always remember that Yes, they need they they are our hope. And this is has to be the most compassionate, empathic generation that we have had to date. But they need our support, they need our protection, they need the safe spaces and the whether it's financial support or emotional support in order to continue to do this work. It's um they face a very, very different future than the rest of us faced growing up. I did not have the same existential fears about my future that the young people do today. And so I just would encourage people to remember that while they are our hope um, and we we put a lot on to them, that we also need to take that responsibility of our place in this in this space. Well thank you all. I appreciate those answers. I just wanted to um, invite anyone in the audience to join our group, the Environment and Climate Crisis Council of Democrats Abroad. Uh, someone is dropping a link in the chat now if you're interested. Uh, we, we focus on these issues for in our role as voting, voting uh, citizens abroad and trying to organize political action through, uh, through our, our representatives on these issues. So please feel free to join us. And now uh, another question for anyone in the, in the group, in the, in the panel. Uh, the world is now plunged in yet another fossil fueled war and the U.S. is hopefully on the verge of becoming green energy efficient. Uh, current geopolitics are quite complicated right now and as Democrats represent the only hope of progress against climate change currently in the U.S., do you have any thoughts about how we can both support Democrats and hold them accountable on climate? I can, um, I can start with that one. Um, I think the really important thing to bear in mind is that the some of the big, I mean, so I'll just say some of the most amazing supporters in Congress that we've had um, uh, in Juliana in terms of our legislative side, where, for example, we we have introduced bills recognizing the sort of the legal framework uh, legislatively that we are fighting for in the in the in the lawsuit. And some of the biggest champions of that have been individuals like uh, Sheldon Whitehouse uh, from Rhode Island, Jan Schakowsky from Chicago, Bobby Rush from South Chicago, um, all of whom are Democrats, right? Um, and Democrats have some many Democrats have been are some of our biggest champions in um, in Congress. But it's also worth noting that we filed the case originally against the democratic administration and we are also currently against a democratic administration right the democratic administration is the is the named defendant in the case and so what that does for us is it when when we talk about holding democrats accountable what that looks like is saying recognizing that yes democrats carry the biggest um tendency as currently to you know to fight for 
climate justice in the in the legislative branch. But just because they're a Democrat does not make them a climate champion. And we have many, many examples of Democrats who are not. Um, and so it is up to us as voters when we go to the polls and we're electing Democrats to make sure that these Democrats recognize that to be a Democrat is also to be a climate champion. And, and, and we have to make sure that we are um, that we are always making sure that they are um, yeah, not standing in the way of certain actions uh, that, you know, people like our lawsuit, for example, is taking where we ask, you know, the Biden Justice Department not to oppose us when we go to trial, for example, right? If we if, if, if we can get a favorable ruling by Judge Aiken in the Oregon District Court to put the climate science on trial for the first time in uh, U.S. history, it will be up to a Democratic administration, the Biden administration, not to stand in the way of that trial. Um, and that is where we would really see the opportunity for Democrats to lean into being climate champions like we want them to be. Um, you know, I and, and I, I have a personal I have a personal stake in this but as a side note, because I worked in in national government for a Republican, Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, who I consider for the state that I'm in, because we're an incredibly oil based economy, I consider to be notably forward thinking on climate. So all the more I have a personal stake in we need to make sure that Democrats prove that we can be bigger climate champions than a Republican senator from an oil state, right? Um, I think that's a, I think that's a task that we're up to, but uh, that's up to us as voters to hold Democrats accountable um, to that when we go to vote for them. And I want to build off of what Nathan just said um, and talk a little bit about what also has happened in Juliana since um, the film was released. So back in June, May, June uh, of last year, 2021, uh, Judge Aiken ordered the parties into settlement discussions. And we'd been in settlement discussions with uh, the Biden-Harris administration. And in, in this type of, we'll call it impact, major systemic litigation, what would a settlement look like? And I'd like to... Um, spend a little time talking to you about what happened in another case involving youth, where a settlement was extremely important um, to the way the federal government conducted itself. Back in the Clinton administration, there was a, a case called Flores. And, and uh, essentially in that case, the uh, Clinton administration was sued with how it dealt with undocumented youth crossing the borders. And the, as a result of the litigation being filed, the plaintiffs and the Clinton administration reached a deal as to how the federal government would deal with undocumented youth. And the district court approved the settlement and uh, that settlement controlled the operation of undocumented youth at the federal level until the Trump administration and then the Trump administration came in and wanted to radically change how the federal government dealt with undocumented youth. And the attorneys for the youth waived the settlement agreement in court and said, you can't change the way you do it because this settlement agreement binds the federal government. It doesn't bind an administration like an executive order would do, but it binds the federal government. And both the trial court and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals agreed and said, Trump administration, you are held to the terms of that settlement agreement. Well, now let's talk about Juliana, both as Nathan pointed out, members of Congress, as well as, as numerous other individuals have essentially said to the Biden-Harris administration, you should be sitting down and talking with uh, these youth and settling the case on a way that would help the climate movement going forward. Or as Nathan also said, you should uh, essentially uh, get out of the way and not go to the court of appeals, not use the shadow docket of the Supreme Court, but instead allow the youth to go to trial allow the evidence to be put in before a court. And you can defend it, but the, uh, essentially let the judge issue an order and then move forward on appeals from a judgment that hopefully 
will include a declaration that the government's conduct is unconstitutional. So this litigation can move forward either with the help of the Biden administration or with the Biden administration uh, uh, opposing us. And hopefully they will see the importance to the youth of America in allowing Juliana to go to trial. That is really interesting. Uh, it really sheds a lot of light on this whole process. And that leads me uh, um, nicely into the next question, um, which maybe all of you want to take a crack at. How do you see the chances of making ground with our nation's judiciary so deeply slanted now by the placement of conservative judges during the Trump administration? Will that have an impact? I'm happy to start in on that. Um, when we filed Juliana, uh, we were very conscious that at some point we would be for the United States Supreme Court. So we didn't just adopt a, a, a procedural tactic that would uh, um, ground our case in what I'm going to call extremely progressive uh, court decisions or or, or or uh, essentially be on the cutting edge of the law. So what we did is we focused the case on government harming citizens. And as we all know, that there's conservatives totally uh, uh, are opposed to the government knowingly harming citizens. And if you want to know about how the government has done that, in the movie, you would have seen uh, Gus Speth uh, um, uh, give commentary about what the government knew. Well, that's become a book uh, put out by MIT Press, uh, Gus Speth, or it's, his formal name is James Gustav Speth. It's called They Knew. And it's it, They Knew is essentially Gus's expert report in Juliana. But wh where I'm going with this is we oriented towards the conservative bloc on the Supreme Court. So, for example, the order that came down in July um, 2018 by the Supreme Court refusing to stay Juliana was the last order issued by Justice Anthony Kennedy before he retired. Or if you would have picked up while Chief Justice Roberts unfortunately stayed uh, the trial in Juliana in his order on October 19. Uh, 2018, the full court allowed the case to go forward. And so what and what we've recently done is provided to Judge Aiken what is called supplemental authority as to how recent decisions, well, I'll call them controversial decisions by the current Supreme Court, actually support what we're doing in Juliana, how Dobbs for example, focuses on the right to life. Well, does the right to life end when uh, all of a sudden the baby is born? Or does the right to life continue between birth and death such that the government cannot engage in conduct that harms the lives of U.S. citizens? Well, Dobbs would say the right to life continues. And as a result, the analysis in Dobbs, if applied to Juliana, would uh, uh, would allow the case to go forward through to trial. The same holds true for the uh, gun control decision, uh, the New York versus Bruin case, or in West Virginia versus EPA, where the decision essentially said that the EPA has an obligation to control greenhouse gas emissions. The evidence will be in Juliana that the, the EPA has done anything but controlled greenhouse gas. Uh, emissions. And that are the situation that existed when the EPA was started under Republican President Richard Nixon is substantially worse now uh, uh, than it was back in the 70s. And so what we're going to have by way of, uh, I'm going to call it evidence, and by way of our arguments, will be right in the sweet spot of this conservative court. So we look forward to moving forward to trial in Juliana, where people will see that the evidence is, is right in line with what the Supreme Court says needs to be established to show not only a fundamental right,
but the infringement of a fundamental right. And that's why we believe the current court will support a decision in Juliana. And um, just to add uh, another piece to that, one of the one of the principles that really underpins our lawsuit that comes out of common law, it's not explicitly um, it's not explicitly written in the Constitution, but it, it's very well established in our common law is the principle of the public trust doctrine, which is essentially the idea that governments hold certain natural resources in common in trust for both present and future generations based on, because of the nature of the fact that these resources, things like the air, the water, rivers, you know, shorelines are like by their nature cannot be privatized because they are, they are just in common. And so it is the responsibility of governments to act as a trust for these resources for future generations. One of the first places that that idea came out of was Justinian's code. So this is a principle that far predates the United States government's formation and is something that is assumed at the time of the founding of our nation. So if we wanna talk about sort of an originalist theory of Juliana or an originalist lens by which the court should look at Juliana, we have simply we simply live in a time in which we have never tried to destroy a climate system before by the actions of a government, but that does not mean that the principle of the public trust doctrine has not been there at the founding and far predates the United States and is integral to how our common law has been set up. There were cases that heard it in the 1800s um, and there were cases that heard it in the early 1900s and it, it's sort of been rediscovered in this current modern context, but it is not a novel invention of our moment. It is something that has been embedded um, as the nation has gone on. I also wanted to add to that as um, Phil so eloquently expressed as something that I've seen in the years of following this case and other cases that our Children's Trust has led is, you know, despite who are the judges and it, which direction they lean towards, um, the, the way that Phil and Julia are using precedents and using these cases and decisions that have come out of SCOTUS in favor of Juliana you know, they're, they're so nimble and so brilliant in applying these precedents and these um, decisions to their advantage to argue the case of these plaintiffs. And I, I think that is, uh, you know, that, that does give me hope in, in, in our chances within the courts. And I also wanted to point out that, you know, these kids have been in this case now for seven years they have not been able to present their evidence yet in, in front of a court of law. The, you know, all the motions that you, or all the hearings that you see in the film, none of these are trials. They are all hearings based on procedural motions that have been filed by the government. And so the, the importance of getting to trial and presenting their evidence, presenting the scientific evidence and the historical evidence in their case that gives me a lot of hope in our judicial system because, you know, they, the, the, the magic of the courts is that everyone's using the same words and they're applying the same laws. And so that, you know, the, 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 the fact that these plaintiffs can then present their evidence and these judges have to rule based on the evidence that, that is presented. I think it's really hard, even with a conservatively slanted um, court, it's very hard to ignore the evidence and the rule of law. Thank you. I think um, Caroline had a, a question um, for the panel. Yes, well, um, I believe it's been mentioned a little bit already, uh, but if anybody has any more to, in, uh, to, could elaborate more on the new case against the US Energy Department, and how this case uh, asking the US national energy system to be declared unconstitutional differs from the original case. Sure, so the amended complaint that we're going to bring will essentially seek to only uh, um, move forward on declaratory relief. And then perhaps the judge could um, allow injunctive relief later on. So let's walk through what that means. Again, back as you saw in the movie, what, we're, what we were uh, trying to get the judge to do 
is to, in essence, issue an order that would stop uh, things like new leases by the federal government uh, for oil and gas and other fossil fuel extraction on federal lands, which is a, a major component of fossil fuel emissions, getting what I'm going to call the, the fossil fuel bad stuff out of the ground. And so uh, and we um, really uh, tried to focus the court on how the federal government is a significant component of the uh, fossil fuel energy system. And as a result, just controlling through injunctive relief, the federal government's conduct would substantially uh, ameliorate or substantially lessen the fossil fuel emissions uh, globally and would uh, um, improve the lives uh, of these plaintiffs. As we saw in the movie, the Ninth Circuit said, the federal courts can't go that far. So with the amended complaint, which is essentially a continuation of Juliana through uh, seeking to amend the complaint to only allow for declaratory relief and limited injunctive relief, we believe the court will allow us to go forward and, and limit the remedies that we're seeking so that we will not run into the uh, issues that the two of the three judges on the Ninth Circuit panel saw as a problem. And that's what we're waiting for an order for, from Judge Aiken, and we hope it comes down promptly so we can get to trial. And Phil, maybe it's also helpful to add, this is not a new case that's been brought. This is still the same case. This is all the Juliana case. This is just a new motion within this case that has been brought because the case did not die with the Ninth Circuit Court decision, this is a remedy or this is a tool that the that the plaintiffs are using to um, kind of mold and shape their argument uh, in a way that the Ninth Circuit Court, that it's more in line with how the, how the Ninth Circuit Court ruled, so that it gives an opportunity for Judge Aiken to allow the case to go to trial. Um, and I also wanted to state that it's that the U.S. Department of Energy is not, it's not like this is a new motion that was filed specifically against them. They have always been a defendant in this case. The, 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 the case was filed against the office of the president. And how many other defendants, Phil, is it 12, 11 or 12? Yes. Yeah. So we, you know, Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, Department of Commerce, there's a lot of, of different departments that are all defendants within this case. But the focus that they're trying to bring to it right now is for Judge Aiken to declare that the national energy system is unconstitutional so that this will allow the case to move forward to trial. So um, I have a, a question. As Democrats living abroad, we see a lot more evidence of climate change all around the world than just in the United States. Um, at the end of the film, you mentioned there was a mention of 25 countries that there were youth suits being brought. Um, can we, can, can anyone speak a little bit more about what's being done with those suits or where they're at at this point? Because I find that also very interesting. Sure. And um, just to give a quick summary, so we've been involved historically in litigation um, in Colombia, in the Urgenda case in the Netherlands, for example. Uh, we've also been involved in like the uh, uh, Neubauer decision in Germany, where in uh, March of 2021, the federal constitutional court determined the legislature had violated uh, in, in intertemporal uh, uh, guarantees of freedom. Um, and uh, we'd been in the uh, involved in the uh, decision in France. But now, uh, going forward, we kind of have three paths uh, we're going in. So we have uh, country uh, litigation in Canada, Mexico, um, and Uganda, for example. And uh, there's going to be announcements uh, on these cases in the next several months. Um, and I don't want to steal their thunder. So I ask you to go to our Children's Trust website, sign up for the notices, and you'll learn what we're doing in those three cases. But I also want to point out that the European Court of Human Rights 
has allowed um, our Children's Trust, uh, along with uh, uh, other organizations such as Oxfam and the Center for Climate Repair at uh, Cambridge, uh, to um, intervene in um, uh, litigation or in matters before the U European Court of Human Rights. And this is very significant because uh, these decisions before the Grand Chamber will have a huge effect on um, uh, what happens. Uh, uh, and the, for example, the Augustino, uh, Augustino case and others have been granted the right of, of um, uh, to intervene in three of those cases. And the final point I want to make is like we did in Juliana, where we've tried to focus on uh, essentially changing the rights uh, uh, to allow uh, a protection of a climate uh, capable of sustaining human life. What we're also trying to do in uh, international matters is do a turn or a change um, on the science, because you see so many people advocating for 1.5 degrees. Let me just tell you, 1.5 degrees is as good as death. You don't want to go there. And so we're advocating very much in, uh, uh, in the international arenas that at 1.5 the degrees, that's, that's a, a symptom of an underlying problem, that you need to address the underlying problem. And it's not 1.5, it's, it's 350 parts per million or below. And we need to overturn that 1.5 degree mindset. So we're doing filings and the like to focus people on how bad uh, 1.5 degrees um, is. And so that's a brief summary of what's going on internationally. Um, I have a quick follow-up. Um, and then I think Miguel has a question from the audience. But Nathan mentioned several times uh, Greta Dumbari. And I'm wondering, have you guys coordinated with her or been in touch with her? Um, this, of course, she has led a, a huge uh, international movement of youth. And I'm wondering, uh, has there been any contact? Well, the most, um, the most explicit contact um, was that I testified with her when she came to the United States for the first time in front of the US Senate Climate Change Task Force in DC in 2019. But in, but you know that that was sort of a that was sort of a side uh, uh, note. But I think more importantly, Greta, with um, I want to say sixteen other youth from uh, around the world, filed suit in the United Nations uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was signed by I believe forty five countries. Um, and that was a motion that she filed. It's not, it wasn't in, uh, I, I'm, I'm not quite so familiar with uh, how the, you know, the United Nation kind of convention court process works, but um, I know that, you know, there were a lot of parallels with sort of the, 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 the legal strategy movement that, that we were using. And certainly, um, and, and then certainly as individual plaintiffs, a lot of us are wearing many, many hats. So certainly um, we've been in contact with her in various capacities, both with and without the lawsuit. But um, yeah, I, I, I think I think one of the things that I most admire about Greta is that um, she doesn't really aspire to the spotlight, that she really is a, a, a movement player. And so I think that we're all sort of recognizing that we operate in different um, lenses and we operate in different components of the movement. As you mentioned, she leads you know, Fridays for Future, which is sort of the youth upswell around the world. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that we all just sort of build on each other's momentum um, and we're really, yeah, I think we're really grateful for the, the work that she's done to bring us, to bring this issue to the forefront of national and international consciousness. Um, and, 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 and we still continue to work in our, in our spheres of us kind of focusing on the law, you know, her focusing on kind of European and global uh, politics in like legislatures, et cetera. But we definitely do uh, work together um, frequently. Really cool. I think Miguel has a, a question from the audience. Yes, I do. Uh, so a member of the audience asked us, how can we help those lawsuits that are currently uh, underway abroad? So how can we, U.S. citizens living abroad, help those lawsuits? That's the question. Support you. And support yeah, how can we support cases. you? 
Yeah, you know, I I, I, know I can take this first stab at this question. What a you know one of the I do think that one of the challenges about a, a lawsuit is that it is it can be really technical, but I think and a little bit sort of like pie in the sky compared to something like you know get out on the street. Um, and I think all of the above strategy is important. But one of the things that really I think is important related to lawsuits and especially to Juliana is use the language of climate rights when you go out in public. Talk about the fact that your children have a right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life, right? Um, and 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 in a, and if you really you know lean into that. Talk about the fact that it's not that we invented that right. It's that that right's always been there, but we have never had a government trying to destroy our climate system, right? It is, a, it, is a, it is something that we assume in parents' generations and at the founding of our nation, at the founding of other nations. And it's a principle that goes so far back into the you know, pre-Middle Ages, but that it exists. And that right now, more than ever, there are cases all over the world um, and you know, Juliana versus the United States in America that are focused on bringing that right to fruition and, and, and tangible impact in, the, in this moment. So in terms of like a non-monetary, non um, kind of way to support us, I think really using the language of climate rights in whatever capacity, job, academia, work that you are in public, when you're drinking at the bar with friends, you know, say like, did you know that my children have a right to a climate system capable of sustaining mm -hmm. human life and that it is embedded deeply in the principles of our nation's founding? Um, just just you know. on that note, Caroline uh, mentioned a question, which is right on that alley. Um, and I'd like to give her the floor to ask it. Yes, well, uh, uh, Nathan and, and Phil, you both mentioned the past uh, a lot when it came to things that inspired you to, to, fi um, to figure out how to fight for the future and all that. Um, would it then be... Um, what would changing the language towards less about talking about like a vague future and more about talking about something that we all know of? We know of all these uprisings that other youths have have done in the past and and putting it into the context of the here and now, understanding that we ourselves are just like them and instead of teaching it as something that, you know, that is a distant past, trying to put it more, bring it more into the present. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I really like that question. Um, I, I think it's really a matter of telling your story of place whenever you're talking about these pie in the sky concepts or the climate movement globally. Talk about, where you come from, what your, you know, what your family and your grandparents and your great grandparents did, especially if they, you know, if they, if you tangibly live in the same space or you understand, sort of, you know, that like I, like for I, to use a personal anecdote, right? I live in Alaska, and if we don't have snow and ice, we don't really have an Arctic identity anymore, right? And so, being third generation, having my grandparents move up here before statehood. I really can tangibly connect to what it was like to live with multiple weeks of 40 below Fahrenheit, you know, and I know that sounds horrible to people, but right, like sitting around a cozy wood stove and going skiing. And these are things that are not tangible without snow, for example. And I'm not, and that's just my sort of urban Alaskan experience, but I can't even connect to the 10,000 plus years of indigenous identity that is inextricably connected to snow and ice. Um, and I direct people to the right to be cold by Sila Cloutier, if, if you want a tangible Inuit perspective on place, right? Place and how we connect climate justice to place. More specific to the movement though, I think, I think in the trailer, for example, it introduced the idea that struggles happen in generations and so you can connect it to how have youth in the past had to fight for their tangible right to a future right um like how did civil rights youth have to fight for over 50 years with with the first case filed in like the earliest of the 1900s against brown v or against a uh, separate but equal in schooling and it took over almost 50 years and that's just the tangible parts that we see in the courts, right? But it took almost 50 years for them to get to Brown versus Board of Education, right? 
and, 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 and just kind of connecting those struggles, the tangible struggles that multiple generations of youth went through using the same processes and that we replicate those civil rights processes in every struggle that we have in our generation. So those are, that's another, there's place-based way to connect it. And then there's also the kind of movement-based way where you repeat it through generations on what your unique um, struggle always is. What a great answer and what a great uh, question, Caroline. Uh, that gives me a lot of food to, for thought uh, as we continue forward. We are running short on time. I, um, I have a, one more question for you and then I don't know how tired you are, um, but I, I know that there have been a lot of um, elected representatives, nine senators and 38 congressional representatives who signed on to the letter, a letter to the DOJ pleading with them um, to hear the case. Um, what can you tell us about that? And have they maintained consistent support or has that fallen off? Can you share with us some of uh, your experiences uh, regarding the, our elected representatives and their support? Anybody can take a crack at it. I'll take a quick crack. Our, our members of Congress have been remarkable. They've, they, they support us, uh, uh, not only uh, them as individuals, but their staffs. And uh, they, they uh, help give us access to the people we need to talk to. And we believe it is working within uh, the Biden-Harris administration. And so we're really looking at these midterms to hopefully not only get those, I'm gonna call them advocates uh, um, for uh, youth uh, in addressing the climate crisis, but we get more, more advocates who see the beauty of uh, um, uh, getting a right uh, to a climate capable of sustaining human rights on the books so that Congress can then use legislation to build off that right. The executive department can then use policies and uh, uh, regulations to build off that right. And, and that's where the members of Congress have been uh, incredibly helpful uh, up to this day. So they don't, they don't feel like you're against the US government? No, yeah. just to the contrary, they're, they're trying to, I'm, I'm gonna call it, they're, they're trying to move uh, uh, the, the federal government to a more, let's use the term, enlightened way of what's going to happen in the future if we don't address this issue right now. Um, and therefore, we all need to make sure that these enlightened senators and, and congressional representatives remain in office and that we build on our majorities there, that we keep them in office. I'm going to plead with everybody again, make sure you get your ballots back, make sure all your friends and families um, back stateside are getting out to vote. Um, I'm not sure we've ever had a midterm more important than this one, especially for the, the climate emergency that we are facing today. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna finish up soon. And I'm wondering if anybody has any last words they would like to add. We are so deeply grateful for your participation today. I have learned so much. I'm sure everybody else has as well. I just have a quick picture to show you. Um, this is my granddaughter, uh, Alice, on my shoulders with Kelsey Juliana. And I do this work for free. I do this work pro, pro bono because at some point uh, in our lives, my granddaughter is going to look at me and say, Papa, what did you do during the climate wars? And I want to be able to say that I did everything I possibly could to make sure that you had the same wonderful climate that I had growing up. And so whoever's out there watching this, Take a look at uh, photos of young people that you have on your desk or on your wall and just commit yourself to make, do whatever it takes, voting, donating, activism, whatever it takes to go out there and make this world a better place 
when it comes to climate. Thank you. I just wanted to add as well that, you know, when you're reaching out to your representatives and um, your elected officials, encourage them to watch the film, encourage them to learn about this case. I, it's, it's a complicated case. There's a lot that went into this and there's a lot that the case has gone through. And I did my damnedest to try to <laughs> try to relay all of that in the film. Um, and I think, I think watching the film is really the best way to understand this case. Um, so, you know, share it widely with those that you know, ask people to engage in this case, to follow it, to support it. Um, and, and also, um, you know, you can go to our website, which um, Angela put in, into the chat. Um, you can engage with us. We also have educational distribution. So you can bring this film to your schools, to your universities, to your law schools internationally around the world. Um, the film is also available on Netflix internationally around the world and it's in 30 languages. Um, so just, you know, engage in this case, engage in what these youth are standing for and um, really encourage others to follow this as well because I foresee that this case is going to trial and it's going to be really on the front lines of, of our climate policies in the US. Nathan, did you have any uh, last? Well, yeah, uh, I'll I'll be I'll just be very brief and just simply reiterate uh, a point that I think is really really key that I made earlier, which is the only thing in the future that is certain is that danger and hardship and struggle for this generation is ahead. But the only thing that is uncertain is whether we are succumbing to it and kind of swallowing ourselves into our nihilism or whether we are choosing to step up in this moment like generations of civil rights and justice leaders from every generation have in the past that we stand on. Um, profound words uh, to end on, Nathan. Thank you very much. You are all my heroes. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you everybody who attended. Um, vote for the climate, vote for our future, vote for our children. And good night or good morning or good day from wherever you are calling in in the world.